Welcome to Perkins School of Theology on the campus and part of Southern Methodist University. And welcome to the Perkins Theological School for the Laity. This is an annual three-day event in late March, which features Perkins faculty and other guest faculty teaching half-day or day-long classes to laity who come in really from many parts of the country, including from Alaska. If you have never come to this event, please consider coming next year. We will be here again March 28th to the 30th in 2019. This lay school is sponsored by the Office of External Programs at Perkins, and I have the delight to be the Associate Dean of External Programs at Perkins, and thus am responsible for this evening. Tonight, as part of this annual lay school, Perkins is hosting the Wallace Chapel Lecture, which is funded by the Foundation for Evangelism. This lecture provides the opportunity for a United Methodist Seminary like Perkins to bring in a national leader in evangelism, like Professor Teasdale, to give a lecture related to evangelism. Before I introduce Professor Teasdale, I want to give a brief word about the Foundation for Evangelism, which again is making this lecture possible. More than 30 years ago, the Foundation for Evangelism cast a vision to equip pastors during their seminary education for the role of evangelism in their daily ministry. This vision was realized through the flagship program, grant program of the foundation, which is the E. Stanley Jones Professors of Evangelism. And it was my honor from 1994 to 2001 to be a foundation professor of evangelism at Duke Divinity School. Today, the program supports professors at United Methodist related seminaries around the world in the United States, in Zimbabwe, in Germany, and in Russia. The current president of the Foundation for Evangelism is here tonight, and I'd like Jane Boatwright Wood. Would you please stand up? Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Tonight's speaker, Professor Mark Teasdale, is the E. Stanley Jones Associate Professor of Evangelism at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois, where he has taught since 2008. This is a homecoming for Professor Teasdale because he earned his PhD under the directorship of Professor Ted Campbell here at SMU, and some of the people that he's known since his Dallas days are here with us, and we're delighted to have you. Mark is the author of several books, um, three books that are out here tonight um, in the lobby for sale. His uh, dissertation now book is uh, Methodist Evangelism, American Salvation, The Home Missions of the Methodist Episcopal Church, 1860 to 1920, a book that I have used in my research and profited from very much. He's also written two books um, uh, for a general audience. One is, and my students are actually required to read this, Evangelism for Non-Evangelists, Sharing the Gospel Authentically, and Go, How to Become a Great Commission Church. Mark is also an ordained elder in the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church. And after his lecture, uh, we will have a time of Q&A, so if you've got thoughts, write them down before, like with my brain, they will uh, disappear, write them down, and we'll have some time to engage with Mark after the lecture. So let's welcome Professor Mark Teasdale. Oh, I think you got my top. I think you got my top one. Sorry, there you go. I need to remember what I'm saying. It is a real honor to be here tonight. Thank you so much uh, for welcoming me back to SMU and to Perkins. 
Um, I had the privilege of being here for three and a half years. We lived here. This is where my son was born as well. And uh, if Anna, Katarina, and Luke are watching right now, hi. Um, <laughs> it's, it's 30 degrees warmer here than it is where you are right now in Chicago. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back. So thank you for the gift. And thank you also to the foundation again. I want to, to reiterate what Priscilla said. Uh, the foundation has been a huge part of my life over the last several years. I was offered the opportunity to be the first Denman Fellow. Uh, the Denman Fellowship is a fellowship that allows for a PhD student to focus on evangelism while also studying a classical field in theological education. In my case, it was history here at SMU. Uh, and so they supported me through that, and then I transferred over and became one of the Jones professors, and so they've supported me along through that. So it's been uh, 13 years now that, uh, that uh, we've been together, and so I'm, I'm grateful for the foundation in doing that. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Professor Pope Levinson for the, the wonderful hospitality that she and, uh, and Mary Roberts have shown in bringing me here. Uh, they've been working with me for, gosh, it's like half a year now, I feel like. We've been in, in conversations and have emails back and forth about all this, and the hospitality has been truly excellent, so thank you for that. Uh, and it is a little bit intimidating to have two, actually, of the, uh, the, the luminaries in early evangelism literature uh, for the United Methodist Church here, both in Professor Pope Levinson and also in Professor Stephen Gunter, uh, who are sitting here. And I've, uh, I've, I've used both of their works in the past and, and have my students reading their stuff as well. So there's kind of a mutual admiration society that we, that we have going on. Um, so, I'm just saying right now, neither of you are allowed to ask questions. So at the end, I just... <laughs> I realize I'm a generation late to claim the song, but if you heard when you were sitting down and had the music piping in, that was Don McLean's American Pie, right? It was released in 1971. Notwithstanding, it's one of my all-time favorite songs. In it, McLean described the loss of innocence and trust in American idealism. And I think the song has a resonance for each, each generation of Americans as we come of age and reflect on the changes that we've seen. What's particularly powerful about the song for me is the amount of sacred and even evangelistic imagery that McLean used. At the opening of the song, he lets us know that he was delivering, quote, bad news on every doorstep. I won't try to sing this for you, but you know where I'm pointing to. As if to remedy the bad news in the final verse, he tells us, I met a girl who sang the blues and asked her for some happy news. Right? Desperate for good news to counteract the bad news, he's disappointed because she just smiled and turned away. He can't even find solace in the old routines of life as he finds out when he went down to the sacred store where he'd heard the music years before, but the man there said the music wouldn't play. But the most pointed lines come after that. In the streets the children screamed, the lovers cried, and the poets dreamed. But not a word was spoken, the church bells all were broken. From McLean's point of view, as the rest of America's institutions collapsed, so did the church. The upheavals of the nation left the church just as voiceless to speak good news as anyone else. As a result of the church losing its ability to share the good news, even God seemed absent. McLean made this point in the following words, and the three men I admired the most, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They caught the last train for the coast, the day the music died. Without a church that could speak clearly about the power and presence and hope of God in the midst of the chaos that his generation of, of Americans were experiencing, all that was left for McLean to do was to complete his dirge for the idealism he had lost. This song lays down an incisive critique of the church in the United States 50 years ago, and it presents a powerful challenge for the church today. The United States, really the world, let's not just focus in on our own country, has continued to be racked by waves of disillusionment and has seen even more innocence eroded away during these first two decades of the 21st century. Have our church bells been audible in the midst of this? Or are they still broken, unable to ring out meaningfully to those desperate to hear good news that will overcome the bad news all around them? 
This is an essential question for us to answer because the world is in the midst of a severe leadership crisis. In a time when the tectonic plates are shifting beneath us, opening up chasms in culture, economics, and politics, we have very few people who are stepping forward with the capability of leading us to a new and better place. Rather, we have reactionary leaders who recoil at these changes. Instead of casting a vision of an imaginative, imaginative and better future, they resort to retrenchment, active ignorance of the unfolding problems, demagoguery, elitism, populism, and even violence to try to beat back the unwanted changes. None of this will work. We need leaders who will actually lead, awakening our hearts and minds with pictures of a new and better future and welcoming us to take the difficult journey to get there. Now, the corporate world has sought to try to fill this gap. Its answer is found in technology. The idea is that through investing in and distributing even more advanced technology to the world's population, we'll find ways to increase everybody's quality of life and so deal with the problems that people are facing. As promising as that sounds, technological change is not the same sort of, is not the sort of transformation that we need. This is because our capacity to engage in technological improvement is rarely matched by our ethical wisdom to wield that technology well. Even technology developed with the best of intentions can end up being devastating to life. Any number of dystopian novels point to this, as did Albert Einstein in an article published by the New York Times in 1946. Our world, he wrote, faces a crisis as yet unperceived by those possessing power to make great decisions for good or evil. The unleashed power of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. While this quote pointed specifically to nuclear war potentially coming from the purported goodness of harnessing atomic power, it is not difficult to apply this logic to other technologies that we laud today. Witness the data mining out of Facebook just this past week. So it is that corporate leadership and technology will not solve the gap in leadership that we have in the world today. So what will? It's into this lacuna that I believe the church has an opportunity to step, especially in its evangelistic ministry. You're probably wondering when I get to evangelism, right? Put plainly, and let me just put this out here right now, the thesis of my, my whole lecture, evangelists are the leaders the world needs today. I make this bold claim based on the work of James Cousas and Barry Posner. Based on over 30 years of research across the globe, their book, The Leadership Challenge, now in its sixth edition, some of you may have read this along the way, especially if you're involved in, in uh, leadership in the corporate world, lays out five broad practices someone must engage in to be an effective leader. These are, first, to model the way. Model the way by articulating and practicing core values while inviting others to make common cause with those values. Second, inspire a shared vision. You inspire a shared vision by laying out a beautiful and realistic picture of the future that excites people to accept it and work toward it. Third, to challenge the process. We challenge the process by always being ready to listen to others and to innovate looking beyond accepted boundaries to see how to better work toward the vision while staying true to our values. Fourth, enable others to act. We enable others to act by promoting mutual respect among people and honoring people for their gifts. Fifth and finally, we encourage the heart. We encourage the heart by celebrating successes and giving people time to relate to each other as whole human beings, not just as functionaries that get work done. Why do I think that evangelists can lead so well according to these five practices? Because evangelists carry a message unlike any other message that the world has to listen to. As St. Paul described himself and his co-workers in 1 Corinthians 4.1, evangelists are servants of Christ, and stewards of the mysteries of God. That's our message. The stewards were mysteries of God. As stewards of these mysteries, I would argue that evangelists alone can provide the kind of leadership needed by the world today. 
And it is with this leadership that the church bells will ring out loudly and strongly, not just as a parochial call to belief, but as a call to a new way of being unlike anything else the world can experience. We'll move out of those old modes of thinking that Einstein thought were so dangerous. Now let me be clear about my terms here at the beginning, as any scholar ought to be. When I say evangelist, I am not just speaking of the small percentage of Christians that are named as having a gift in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, right? So not what Rice Brooks is talking about. I mean all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ because all of us are called to live our faith in a way that others can see it and respond to it. So this is for all of us who claim the name of Jesus. When I say stewarding the mysteries, I mean that we are not only to believe the gospel, and to talk about the gospel, but must allow our lives to be shaped by the gospel so that we can effectively and credibly lead others to it. And per Paul's description of the gospel as a mystery, there's more involved here than we might think. And we'll unpack that over the course of the lecture. When I say that we as evangelists are leaders for the world, I mean that we are already equipped with all that we need to lead people of the world to a better future. So much of leadership is not defined by flashy displays of power, but, as Kuzis and Posner point out, through forging solid relationships with others in which we can call them to live toward a common vision with common values. We have everything we already need to do this right now. It's not a matter of whether we can generate all this up. It is, rather, as St. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.16, whether we simply live up to what we have already attained. Over the next hour, and actually I'm partway through the hour now, so it's not a whole hour that's coming yet. Over the next hour, I would like to describe what is involved with stewarding the mysteries of God as evangelists, weaving through it how evangelists are also engaging in the practices that make them leaders for the world, hence the title that you've got behind me here. We will do this by following the practices that are laid out by Kuzes and Posner. So we start first with the idea that leaders challenge the process, looking beyond accepted boundaries to see how to better work toward the vision while staying true to one's values. Now, if you were taking notes, which I see a few students that are over here, um, you'll notice that I started a different place than Kuzis and Posner do. This isn't their first one. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because evangelism the very basis of it is inviting people to live in a new way that challenges the conventional wisdom. So starting at a place where we challenge the process makes the most sense if we're going to steward the mystery well. Now, let's talk about this term mystery. It may seem a little odd in relation to evangelistic work. After all, isn't the point of evangelism to make the gospel as clear as possible to everybody? So to be clear then, the mystery that Paul talks about stewarding is not the basic content of the gospel, that God sent Jesus Christ to save sinners, but the way in which God accomplished this, through crucifixion. And, as we will see, that has a multitude of implications for how we order our lives and how we can lead the world. The idea that a God would take human form to carry out that God's design is something that actually fits with conventional wisdom. Even pagan myths accepted this. Zeus, Apollo, and numerous other gods in Greek and Roman mythology had done this many times, showing up in human guise to carry out various projects. Likewise, there were a whole slew of demigods like Hercules, Achilles, Jason, who were human and divine simultaneously. These were inspiring leaders, amazing people with superhuman feats that invited mere mortals to come and follow them. This is the conventional wisdom of the world. It always has been, both then and now. Power, wealth, grandeur, and amazing feats are what identify a great leader, right? That's the way we see it. However, the idea that a human who bore the fullness of God would suffer and die, that's a mystery. <laughs> Contrasted to the various pagan myths, the message that Jesus Christ saved humanity through dying ignominiously on a cross made no sense. Jews and pagans alike struggled to understand this. All of them were used to looking for God or a God appearing in ways that were powerful and impressive, accomplishing great things. But Jesus didn't do that. This is puzzling at best, and it was outright offensive at worst. 
Rather than calling people to emulate heroes of tremendous strength and greatness, the gospel called them to break with the logic of equating knowledge, power, and wealth with godliness and glory. No wonder it's a mystery, as Paul describes it. No one thinks like this, right? Even our kids, they go and watch Justice League or, you know, whatever, the Marvel superheroes, and that's what they see as who they want to lead, right? Who do you want to line up behind? You got Superman and you got Jesus, right? Only one of them stops bullets, so, you know, who do you think is more impressive? No one would think like this. This is a mystery. It's a logic that seems hidden and difficult to explain given how the world usually works. And so right from the start, we see that by stewarding the gospel of the crucified Christ, evangelists lead by challenging the process. Evangelists need to reject the long-standing logic of how to order the world by curtsying to the powerful and replace it with an innovative logic of salvation by faith in the crucified one. Borrowing another term from the world of management, the content of the mystery of the gospel is therefore disruptive. By this, I mean that it strikes at the heart of how most people assign value within the universe, transforming the entire meta-narrative that they use to make sense of why things happen the way they do. Now, this may seem like an extreme thing for those of us who are evangelists to do, right? Going out and challenging people's entire way of making sense of the universe. But then again, the world is in an extreme situation today. It's not like the conventional wisdom of bowing to power and wealth is working out all that well for us. Nothing less than a call to an alternative way of understanding the universe is what's necessary. We can lead people toward this alternative through evangelizing about the crucified Christ. In order to share this alternative, though, we need to embody what living according to the gospel, the gospel of a crucified one, looks like. That's the only way for people to see what a realistic alternative to replace their broken conventional wisdom is. This takes us to the other four practices that Kuzis and Posner give us. So second, leaders model the way by articulating and practicing their core values while inviting others to make common cause with those values. For the evangelist, the primary value that we model as we steward the mystery of the gospel is that of reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is a thorny word these days, having been impressed into service for political debates and specific social positions. However, it is a word worth reclaiming because it is at the heart of the mystery of the gospel, describing how we first relate to God and then how we can relate to one another. We'll be unfolding all of this over the next few practices as we talk about them. If I can make a hermeneutical jump here, and I know in seminaries it's always dangerous to suggest that, you know, St. Paul wrote everything we think St. Paul wrote, but if I can claim that. Claiming a common logic among Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians 5 gives us an excellent description of this view of reconciliation, specifically our reconciliation with God. In it, Paul wrote, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You almost feel like somebody said, I'll pay you a penny for every time you write the word reconcile in that passage, because he keeps dropping it in. This has a message for us as to how to engage in the practice of evangelism today, which is appropriate, since part of stewarding the message is first being transformed by it ourselves. So we need to pattern the life of a, a reconciled life first in our own lives as evangelists if we're going to model the way for others. According to this passage, the crucifixion of Christ shows that all people are equal in the sight of God because of our common sinfulness. Now, this isn't a pleasant message. We find that God takes our sins, the very things that we're most ashamed of, that we least want people to know about, and he thrusts them out into the open through Christ taking them on himself for our forgiveness. And yet, as much as it may be uncomfortable, this is what is necessary for reconciliation with God. 
Reconciliation cannot occur until the offense of one party against another has been acknowledged, confessed, and forgiven. If we want to lead people as we steward the gospel, that means that we cannot be stereotypical evangelists who seem to have all the answers. Instead, we are to be honest about our failings and uncertainties, precisely because we know we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, through the forgiveness of our sins. This kind of vulnerability might seem frightening. After all, there's a certain amount of protection when we wrap ourselves in the cloak of the superior evangelist who's kind of reaching out to help the benighted folk around us. Yet, making that move runs counter to the very logic of the gospel that we're presenting. If we're going to lead the world to a place where it desires humility over grandiosity, then we must start by modeling the value of being reconciled with God through being honest about our failures above protecting our own right for privacy. There's more, though. Modeling the way of reconciliation also calls us to abandon our idols. We've already seen how achievement, wealth, social status, and other human accomplishments do not lead to glory. As such, we must be careful not to allow any of these things to become idols that pull us away from the reconciliation with God by convincing us that they give us meaning in our lives. In addition to these usual suspects, we must also beware of other idols that can masquerade as essential aspects of our identities. In this case, I'm talking about social categorizations. In a day when identity politics has all but polarized the cultural landscape, as well as the church, including leading our own United Methodist Church right up to the brink of schism, it is as well that we hear Paul call out that these categorizations can be idols. In Galatians 3, Paul wrote, For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I've heard this passage exegeted to suggest that those who follow Christ ought to be agnostic to how people live. Since we already are reconciled to God by Christ, we ought to focus on Jesus alone. How we behave or categorize ourselves has no implications for how we relate to God. This seems to me off base, falling into the abyss of antinomianism that has long plagued those of us who hold to salvation by faith through grace. Instead, I believe Paul's point here is that if we value being reconciled to God by Christ, receiving the very identity of Christ through baptism, then we are to leave aside all other identities. This does not mean that we cease to have nationalities, ethnicities, a social status, a sex, or other, other categories that relate to us. It does mean that we no longer identify ourselves by these things. They describe us they do not define us. If we do let these things define us alongside of our baptism, they become idolatrous because we have made them equal to the work of God in our lives, seeking to reconcile our identities as much with these categories as with what God has done through Christ for us. Put another way, I'm a white middle-class American male. That's a fair description of me. The moment I elevate being any one of these things to the level of defining me in a way that's equal to my baptism in Christ, I have committed idolatry. It is this sort of idolatry that Paul calls us to reject. The reason that we often want to hold on to these categorizations for how we define ourselves is because, like all idols, they make us think we have greater power than we actually do. If I can wield my nationality, my race, my sex, or some other category in a certain way, that gives me power I can use in how I relate to others. However, as we've already seen, this is exactly the sort of power that the mystery of the crucified Christ disallows. To fail in rejecting the power of these idols is to fail in our leadership of bringing the world to an alternative reality of reconciliation with God by failing to steward the mystery of God well. We are neither challenging the process of how people understand the world, nor modeling the value of reconciliation with God through the crucified Christ. So, to model the way, 
We need to start by letting the transformative work of the gospel change those of us who are stewarding it first. However, if we're going to lead people to reject the power that they believe they have in their various idols and to be honest about their sins so that they can be reconciled, what do we have to offer them in their place? The value of reconciliation with God and all that involves with that uh, is good, but is there anything more? This brings us to the next trait of effective leadership. As leaders, we need to inspire a shared vision by laying out a beautiful and realistic picture of the future that excites people to accept it and work toward it. As it turns out, when we steward the mystery of the gospel, we have a far more beautiful picture to offer people than anything they can receive elsewhere. In 1 Corinthians, Paul makes it clear that the visions offered by the various idolatrous powers are using only human wisdom. In other words, they may promise good things, but they never help people break out of the trap that causes them to value some people more than others in order to feel like they're powerful, right? So there's always a need for me to devalue someone else in order for myself to feel more valuable. The gospel doesn't require this. In fact, it prohibits this. Its logic points us to a completely different understanding of the universe in which one loving God reconciles all people through humility rather than heroic action and in so doing makes all people equal in their ability to receive that salvation by faith. In offering such a dramatically different vision, the gospel makes it clear that it is not just one more idea among many or one more slogan to be rallied around. Rather, the gospel is the very power of God. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in human wisdom, but in the power of God. To steward the mystery of God calls us to be humble, but it also calls us to expect the power of God to be present in the world. We are not just trying to live and speak in a way that people find meaningful, as important as that is. We're living and speaking in a way we believe God will come through to transform others by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is essential, as it sets apart the vision we are casting for others to follow from the conventional wisdom. Our vision is of a universe in which there is a God that not only reconciles us as individuals, but of a universe that is held in the omnipotent hands of that God. Moreover, that God is active, shaping and transforming the universe. This explains why we're so intent on leading people to challenge the ways that they understand the universe. Because we understand the universe itself is not a set thing. Rather, it's something subordinate to God. To define our vision by what is created rather than the one who creates it simply makes no sense. Put another way, we're not just trying to help people envision a slightly better version of the universe as it is. We're opening their eyes to see a completely reborn universe that is defined by the powerful and gracious God who created it and redeemed it through crucifixion. This means that we can be bold in our evangelism. Rather than fearing that people will not accept our evangelistic efforts, as so often we are because it's socially awkward to talk about Jesus, right? We can step forward to share our message and live our humble lives with the assurance that God is active in the world as a participant in the evangelism that we're doing. Now, of course, boldly stepping forward to demonstrate humility and reconciliation may seem like a recipe for being derided by the people around us who believe in the power of the powerful. The Bible agrees with you. As Paul and the other New Testament authors assure us, we will certainly face persecution from those that don't want to receive our message. And here's where we find a new aspect of the mystery that we steward. By humbling ourselves to accept and be formed by the crucified Christ, we not only experience reconciliation with God, we also place ourselves in a situation where we encounter the resurrection of Christ. This is an essential part of the mystery as well. Without it, our disruptive message is at best just so much idealism. Being freed to be reconciled with God at the cost of giving up our idolatry and rejecting conventional wisdom would be too pricey 
if all we had was the assurance that God is active in the present. However, God is not only active in the present. God has also prepared the future for us so that how we live now will determine how we live then. Those of you who were in chapel earlier this afternoon got to hear a far more eloquent version of this than what I'm about to say in Professor Pope Levinson's sermon. If the gospel of Jesus crucified draws us together to lay down our idols and acknowledge our common need for forgiveness by faith through grace, then the resurrection is the common hope that guarantees God has the power to overcome not only our personal sins and idols, but to overcome evil and death once and for all. As Paul explained in 1 Corinthians 15, I declare to you the gospel by which you are saved if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, on the third day according to the scriptures. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father and puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. Here is a powerful message indeed. We are not just offering a message of personal reconciliation with God, nor even of one, uh, one in which we can encounter God in the present world, but a message that states the entire creation we live in will be utterly reconciled and made new by the power of God for all eternity. The world is not a place where negativity and evil run rampant, as much as it may seem like that when we're watching the news, but it is instead in the waiting room of being redeemed fully. Christ's resurrection was the first fruit that demonstrated this redemptive power. We're living now awaiting this consummation, and we evangelize in the midst of this waiting. To steward this message is the stuff of leadership. It inspires people, offering them a future that is both beautiful and that is realistic because it's grounded in the work that God has already done in history in Jesus Christ. It gives us the ultimate reason we can give people for why they should challenge the conventional wisdom of the day, confess their sins, abandon their idols, and let go of the need to be better than others. It gives them assurance that all will be well. And so the striving and competing of this world is actually a destructive distraction that draws us away from the fullness of what God wants to provide for us. It invites people to enter into a story that grants them meaning now and glory in eternity. One other thing, stewarding the mystery of God that includes the crucified and resurrected Christ means that our evangelism ought to be, wait for it, joyful and hopeful. Joy is the assurance of knowing God is present with us even when things are difficult. Hope is the assurance knowing God will lead us somewhere better, even when we can't see it right now. We of all people ought to be inspired by our own message so as to cultivate both joy and hope. By this, others will see the reality of the presence of God in our character. Our world is mired in fear today and is desperate to hear a message of genuine joy and hope. It is ready to be led by those who steward a message of joy and hope. We can do this. But this brings us to a very real concern. Evangelism, as faith in general, is often accused of providing high-sounding ideas without any real capacity to enact them. Up until now, it seems that this is what I may have been doing all the way through this lecture. I've been talking about how the content of the Christian faith is a mystery that challenges the conventional wisdom of how we value ourselves and make sense of the universe, calling us to be reconciled to God as we live toward a vision of resurrection glory. Right? Sounds great on Easter morning. Makes no sense on the front of the Dallas Morning News. These ideas do challenge our view of the world, but they challenge it so much that it seems questionable whether we can actually enact them. This brings us to our next practice of effective leaders. Effective leaders enable others to act as those who are faithful to the gospel. This is true both for those inside the church, but also for those outside the church. Leadership involves casting the grand visions that inspire people. It also involves forging relationships with people so that they can work together toward that vision, even when there's substantial resistance against that vision coming into existence. 
As stewards of the mystery of God, we need to do this, starting with those who are already committed to the mystery inside the church, and then reaching out to those outside the church. In reaching to those inside the church, we're not unlike Paul when he wrote to the Corinthian church. He did not question that they were Christians, nor that they had accepted the gospel. He did, however, challenge them to grow into the fullness of the gospel they had accepted by recognizing just how different their approach to the world should be based on their faith in the crucified and resurrected Christ. Likewise, we must enable other Christians within the church to act in accordance with the gospel. How do we do that? Of course, all the usual means uh, that we have of calling people to receive God's grace are important. Preaching, worship, education, the sacraments, other means of grace, right? We're Wesleyans, we know about this. However, I want to lift up one specific activity that's especially important to pulling together Christians in a local community, a local congregation, so that they can live out their role of stewarding the mysteries of God. And that's how they steward their resources. Stewarding the mystery of God involves stewarding our actual resources, both financial and otherwise, within the church. Yeah, we're going to go from being way up here and seemingly impractical to like far too practical in just a moment here. The conventional wisdom is that the gospel demands we abandon, the conventional wisdom that the gospel demands we abandon places its emphasis on amassing wealth and prestige. Even with the gospel's admonition on this point, Congregations, and even denominations, find it hard to buck this conventional wisdom. It's good and well to talk about challenging the ways we assign value in the world, but in the end, we live in the real world, and we want our numbers to go up, right? Our congregations are more valuable the more people, dollars, and programs that they've got. We're not the first Christians to think this way. The wealthy Corinthian Christians were convinced of their righteousness because of their physical blessings. They believed that they were fundamentally better than the other Christians because of their wealth and social status. Paul took aim at this, making it clear that their salvation came just as much by faith in the crucified one as everyone else's. Far from being indicators of God's greater favor for them, their physical blessings were given to them so they could serve other Christians, not hoard it over them. In making this claim, Paul showed that stewarding the mystery entails the leadership practice of enabling others to act. It allows us to see our gifts and blessings not as things we hoard to demonstrate we're of greater value than everyone else, but rather as a means that we can join together with other Christians as a body and support one another, enabling each other to act as we seek to be faithful to Christ. Paul makes this clear in explaining why the Corinthian church should give to the poor Christians in 2 Corinthians 8. Our desire, he wrote, is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, the one who gathered little did not have too little. To steward the gospel well means stewarding our resources for the common use of the people of God. It means sharing what we have much of and being open to receive where we're lacking. Right? Both of those things are hard. Right? Sharing and being willing to say, I need someone to share with me. But those are what we need to enable us to act by providing the resources everybody in the full body of Christ needs. This view of stewardship not only breaks the conventional wisdom of valuing those who have more over those who have less, it also breaks down the cult of the congregation that we have developed in the church. All right, I know there's some pastors in the crowd, so I, I served for 12 years as a pastor. I get this. It steps on my toes, too, for what it's worth. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Um, local congregations are certainly critical to sharing the gospel in a meaningful way on the ground in a contextual situation but they can also become serious impediments to stewarding the mystery of God when sustaining and growing them becomes idolatrous. This is not hard to have happen, sadly, because the culture has so inculcated in us the value of competition and success by number. The ultimate goal of this is to reach celebrity status. 
Our congregation will be the one that gets mentioned at general conference or gets written up in Christianity Today or in Outreach Magazine. Our congregation will have its pastor be the one that gets invited to go to the White House or to talk to the, the high-profile people. Our congregation will get noticed. If we steward our resources in our congregations with this goal in mind, let me be clear, we are then stewarding the cultural fantasy, not God's mystery. No matter how well we articulate the vision of Christ, our use of resources in our congregations will show that we don't really believe it. By Paul's argument, our numbers are indicators of what God has given us to share with others or point to where we need others to share with us. How we budget our resources ought to reflect this. Now, I'll be honest. I've taken my basic finance course, but I'm still not entirely certain how creating a budget would look using this logic of each congregation being linked with another. Perhaps it would look something like asset mapping, if you're familiar with that, with each congregation laying out in a, in a region, gathering together and laying out what it has available to share in the common ministry of the gospel. And then the congregation is determining how they might best utilize what is in the common pot of assets to do the work that God has given them. This might even lead to the group of congregations giving birth to new congregations in places where they feel like that people aren't being reached with the gospel sufficiently. I recognize I'm a little short on specifics here, but I am certain of this. If congregations could find such an open-handed way of operating, it would be a witness to the people inside their own churches that the mystery of Christians that we're called to steward, that it really can be enacted right now. It would also be a witness to the larger world that an alternative way of living and using our resources from what we've got in our conventional wisdom is possible. And this brings us to that second broad relationship we have to make if we're going to enable others to act. We have to relate to those who are outside of the church, living reconciled relationships with them. If we steward a gospel that only points people to God and not a gospel that also points people to each other, right? Loving God and loving neighbor. We misunderstand the gospel. Since the mystery of God is that the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ overcomes the conventional wisdom of how we judge each other's worth, equalizing us as those in common need of God's grace, the door is open for us to relate to everyone in a new way, whether they're Christians or not. This is a point Paul drove home in 2 Corinthians 5 when he described the mystery of reconciliation. Therefore, from now on, he wrote, we regard no one according to the flesh. One of the ways we can do this is by demonstrating that we are not provincial or parochial when we acknowledge the goodness of God breaking into the world. Paul made this point in 1 Corinthians 3 when he was addressing how the Christians in Corinth were debating each other over who was the best teacher to follow. Remember, there was Peter, known as Cephas, Paul, or Apollos. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Since the fullness of God's goodness is found in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we not only can break down the walls that divide us because of the reconciliation God makes available, but we can claim goodness wherever we find it as ours because the source of that goodness is always Jesus. This is even true if we find it among people who are not followers of Christ. That's in italics in my notes, just so you know. E. Stanley Jones, a Methodist missionary through most of the 20th century and one of the greatest workers for reconciliation among nations, whole groups of people, made this point. Drawing from Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 3, Jones argued that Christians have both liberty and law. They have liberty to claim all good things that God offers so long as they remain in Christ, and that's the law. So, Jones explained, all great religious teachers are yours. Here the gospel offers intellectual and spiritual liberty. Provided we remember the, whose we are, we are free to take from all religious teachers whatever of light and truth they have discovered and realized. Based on this thinking, 
Jones was willing to sit at the table with Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists and rejoice in the goodness he heard from their teachings while simultaneously emphasizing the importance of accepting Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Being stewards of the mystery of God does not make us narrow-minded people who insist that everyone see things exactly the same way that we do and that refuse to learn from anyone else. Rather, we recognize that part of the mystery is that we are always looking for who and what might draw us more fully into the Christian faith because God is active in all places and people through the Holy Spirit. In this way, we enable people outside the church to act, right? Enable people to act by inviting them to recognize the good work God is already doing in their lives. We do this both as a teacher and as a learner, in boldness to share the remarkable goodness of the gospel and in humility to receive the goodness of God from others. In both ways, we step forward as a leader, calling people to a renewed vision of themselves and the values of their lives. Being intentional about building relationships with those who are not Christian and spending time listening, listening to them is the way that we do this. Now, so often, I think we tiptoe around this relationship building idea, either because we believe that we're making friends with an ulterior motive, like, I don't really like you, but I need to get a notch in my belt by getting you to heaven, so I'm going to hang out with you, or because we're afraid these people will undercut our own faith, like, whoa, yeah, that's a really good idea. I guess I'm going to give up on this whole Christian thing, right? However, based on the mystery we steward, neither of these is actually a concern. We're meeting people ready to hear, receive, and celebrate the goodness that they have in their lives. And in return, we're ready to share the goodness we have through Christ with them. In the midst of this, we trust that God's Spirit will be active to reconcile us to one another and to God. There is no guilt tripping or condemnation or ulterior motive or potential apostasy involved. Imagine the kind of leadership that this witness could provide in our current culture. In a day when people feel pressed into polarized ways of thinking and when nuancing how we view other people is often frowned upon as weak or unfaithful by the group we're supposed to be a part of, a living, breathing example of Christians who could openly share their resources with each other and who could approach non-Christians with the assumption of encountering goodness in them would be amazing. It would be the kind of example that people would want to follow. They would want to learn more about the mystery that sets us free from the fetters of this broken and angry age and lets us live with an eye toward goodness in ourselves and others. And I think, by the way, this is why they're so much interested in Mr. Rogers again. I mean, I know that sounds goofy, but you know, there's the new movies coming out. Mr. Rogers was a Presbyterian minister, right, who had all comers that came on his show. Everybody he met with grace and with love and respect, and he told everyone they were special, right? I mean, it didn't matter who you were watching that TV screen. It was you he liked, you know? And, and we see that now, and we're like, wow, that's amazing. We want, we want that again, you know? This guy who should be way retro and just like, like belong to the hipsters at this point, and everybody wants him. That's what I'm saying the church can do. This leads us to a final act of leadership, encouraging the heart. We need to encourage the heart by celebrating successes and giving people time to relate to each other as whole human beings, not just as functionaries that get a job done. If the temptation for Christians is to idolize congregations, the corollary to that is the temptation to see individual Christians, particularly the laity, as nothing more than functionaries who get the work of the congregation done. They're like the priests feeding the always open maw of the congregational idol with their time, their exp expertise, and their money. Stop me if you've been there before. Good leaders understand this is not the way to treat people. <laughs> Instead, good leaders treat people as whole human beings, not just those who serve an organizational purpose. If all we have for people who come to our congregations is the opportunity to become members, which opens up the opportunity to sit on committees or the opportunity to volunteer for congregational events, then we're not being very good leaders. We are certainly not leading them based on our stewardship of a mystery that challenges the conventional wisdom. 
we need to find ways to invite them to begin stewarding the fullness of the mystery, even as we celebrate the fullness of their lives. How do we do this? This one I'm a little more specific on by changing the metrics we use to determine if we're being effective Christians. Right now, as I've already said, our metrics tend to be based on the congregation as an institution. How many members, how much money, how many programs. There's nothing wrong with tracking these, but these only consider institutional health, not whether people's lives in the congregation are being transformed. What we need are a new set of measurements that consider how people are taking on the mantle of stewarding the mystery of God in their daily lives. And here's the thing. These new metrics must be focused on what people are doing outside of the church. It's when they're the church scattered. In other words, we would measure how they allow the logic of the gospel to guide them in their daily lives. Are they meeting people who are not Christian and engaging in meaningful conversations with them? Are they praying for God's power to be present in situations they encounter? Are they, are they sharing their personal resources rather than hoarding them? Questions like these are undoubtedly far more intrusive to individuals than our annual fundraising drive is, but they also show us that people really are becoming stewards of God's mystery in a way that that mystery is influencing how they live. And if it is doing that, it means that they are likewise in a position to be an effective leader who inspires people with a life that challenges the conventional wisdom by modeling the value of reconciliation with a vision of glory granted through the crucified and resurrected Christ. And when we see this happening in the church, we ought to celebrate it. Sadly, celebrations are not what most of us associate with the church, much less with evangelists. From the images of the weeping televangelist to the bullhorn toting man shouting about God's love in the city streets to the scolding church matron refusing to let the children take too many cookies after worship. And I know who you are, by the way. <laughs> Christians seem to be anything but a happy bunch. It's little wonder that people are not so excited about accepting our vision of glory if our practice of life right now is so dreary. In fact, though, we do know how to celebrate. We have celebrations in the church when people join or are confirmed, so we know how to acknowledge when someone has done something that strengthens the congregation as a whole. What I'm suggesting is that we just extend this and we celebrate people's whole lives, not just their lives related to the institutional church. By setting up metrics that honor how people serve as stewards and leaders in their interactions with others outside of the church, we also set up a means for helping them recognize how God is intervening in their daily lives. That, in turn, would help Christians, the people in our pews, articulate how, when, and where they see God honoring their stewardship through being present in power to transform people and situations that they enter. The congregation should take time to celebrate these experiences Doing so gives people a chance to claim that they are relating to God and relating to others in ways that they often would not have been able to before they had been made aware of the fact that they could do this through measuring it. It would also give them a way to articulate their faith because they wouldn't have had that so well before. And that's the number one thing I run across. In fact, in writing my books, one of the number one reasons I did it is because in 10 years of teaching evangelism, I found that the primary problem we have is that seminary students come in and they don't even know how to articulate their own faith. They don't even need to know how to answer, why is Jesus important to me, right? If we find a way to celebrate how Jesus is important to us in our churches, in our daily lives, right? And the church celebrates that. People come in, share a testimony, and they don't just do it, and everyone sort of like nods sagaciously, and you're like, oh, that's great, now let's sing a hymn. You know, but we get in there, and we, and we celebrate it. Like, we have cookies, lots of cookies, not just the one, you know? And we celebrate that that's going on. This is going to get people aware and articulate and more engaged in their faith. It would also allow Christians to encourage each other with these stories, letting each other know that this mystery, as disruptive as it is to our daily lives, really does work. God actually shows up in power to bring reconciliation and move people to glory. Celebrating this would also have two other effects. First, it would help rescue the Christian faith from professionalization. 
too often hand in hand with the cult of the congregation is the idea that, the, that Christianity can really only be practiced by those who have given themselves full time to the ordained ministry. By equipping people to recognize the presence of, and power of God in their everyday lives and interactions, we help them to claim their role in leading people to a better future, regardless of their education, training, or the job that they hold. Second, my strong guess is if that people become more dedicated to the stewardship of the mystery of God in their daily lives, they will have a lot to report about how God is showing up and doing amazing things. I really do believe God honors it when people do this. That means the church would be a place marked by celebration. There would still be time for lament, contemplation, and other activities to be sure, but a consistent melody of joy would be de detectable all the way through it. This would be an incredible witness for the world. Who wouldn't desire to be part of a people who experiences joy on such a regular basis? This, then, is what it means to be stewards of the mystery of God. It is to be those who carry with us an alternative wisdom that casts down the false idols that enslave us and breaks through the meaningless categorizations that reduce our humanity and hold us apart from one another. This wisdom is grounded not only in the verbal message of the gospel, but in the power of God to send Jesus Christ as the incarnate one to die and to rise again. This is a beautiful depiction of what God has done and of the reconciliation it makes possible with God and among people. Clearly, when we bring all this together, it seems clear to me that we have a song worth ringing out from our church bells. The question then that I'll finish with is this. Are we ringing them in a way that anyone can hear them and understand them? To do this, we come back to the issue of leadership. To steward the gospel well, we must not only understand what it is, but understand how to lead a broken world that is fraught with idols and divisions into the glorious light of Christ so that they can hear it. By modeling the way to stay firmly committed to our message of the crucified Christ, using our resources in a way that promotes the common good rather than just the building up of one congregation over another, relating to people with the expectation of greeting and sharing the goodness of God with them, and celebrating how we see God in our daily lives, I think we can enact the kind of church bell ringing that we need to do. People can see this and understand it. Yes, you say, but is that enough? My suggestion seems to argue for a lot of local and grassroots level activities. There's nothing grand here. There's no bid for political power or overhauling of the economy. There's no effort at shaping geopolitical or military strategies. There's a place for all of those. I don't deny that. But I think what I'm suggesting is also critical because we need to start with forming ourselves as Christians so that we can be good evangelists and we can lead others. The Roman Empire didn't legalize Christianity at the outset, and it certainly didn't do it because there was a bid for political power. First, thousands of individual Christians and local Christian gatherings witnessed to the mystery of God in their own unpretentious and simple ways by sharing their wealth, feeding widows and orphans, caring for the sick, and gathering for meals and teaching. There's nothing heroic here just the simple, humble offering of gifts for the betterment of one another and for those who are in need outside of the church as well. And yet, in these very simple acts, God moved with remarkable power. Miracles were performed, the sick were healed, the dead were raised, and lives were transformed. This was so powerful that it brought the swift attention of Rome, simple as it was. Rome clamped down hard, fearful of the disruption that the Christians would bring to their well-ordered empire. Yet, like a steady dripping of water on the rock, the Christians persisted and persevered in their stewardship of the mystery. It wasn't easy, and many suffered because of it, often with the blood of the martyrs dripping down onto that rock along with the water. But their perseverance paid off. Over decades, the hard rock of paganism and conventional wisdom gave way until the Roman Empire understood itself to be largely Christian. At the very beginning, to make this happen, Christians needed to understand the power of the mystery that they were called the steward. That's what St. Paul called them to do, and that's what we're called to do again. With clarity about what we steward, we can lead our world out of the pain it is in today into a marvelous new light. 
So let me end by returning to the song. What if the church had been able to provide leadership for Don McLean and the others of his era? Perhaps he would have ended his song this way. And in the streets the children screamed, the lovers cried, and the poets dreamed. But a word of grace was spoken. The church doors all were open. And the three men I admired the most, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they blessed us to the uttermost and assured us that death had died. Thank you. <laughs>